technology here. Uh, today we're going to have, uh, actually we're going to have three lectures uh, in renal. Uh, I'm going to talk first about acid-base balance, uh, and then I'm going to talk about acute kidney injury, AKI, and uh, then at uh, 2.30, Dr. Lederer is going to come over and uh, talk about uh, fluid and electrolyte management. So we'll get started with acid-base disorders. Now, this is a lecture on a very practical approach uh, to acid-base balance. You've already had a lot of acid-base physiology, uh, and this is not a physiology lecture. I, I'm going to assume that you already understand acid-base physiology perfectly well, and uh, may, maybe not perfectly well, but that you have a background in acid-base physiology. Regardless, even if you don't know anything about acid-base physiology, I'm going to give you a clinical algorithm to figuring out every single acid-base disorder. You will need to remember a couple of very simple equations. You will never need to carry a nomogram or a calculator or anything else. At 3 o'clock in the morning when you're on call in the ICU, you, I guarantee you that you will be able to figure out every single acid-base disorder within a matter of seconds. If you can't, give me a call, all right, anytime. Because if you follow this algorithm, it works 100% of the time. So these are our objectives today. Uh, we need to start out uh, with some nomenclature, some vocabulary, because it's important that we communicate um, in the same terms. Language is the currency of thought. And if I know that you understand the language that we're going to use, uh, then I know you'll understand the thinking behind this algorithm. So we're going to start out with that. And then I'm going to want to make sure that you're able to very quickly identify what kind of acid-base disorder is present. And this is going to get very repetitive throughout this next 40 minutes because there are only four things that can happen and there's only a couple of variations of that. And so you'll see how repetitive this algorithm will become, but that's good because you'll remember it and it's very easy to use and it works 100% of the time. In order to use this algorithm, you're going to have to have some rules of thumb about the magnitude of appropriate compensation. And if you remember these rules of thumb, again, it'll facilitate you being able to figure out every single acid-base disorder that you'll ever be presented with in your entire medical career. And then uh, we're going to add to this algorithm a little bit uh, some differential diagnosis for disorders of acid-base balance. So even though it's very quick to categorize the kind of acid-base disturbance that you're going to see or that the, your patient has, it's a little more complicated coming up with a differential diagnosis. So I'm going to give you some examples of a differential diagnosis. And if we have time, we'll work through a clinical problem very much like the kinds of problems that you will see on the internal medicine boards. Uh, when I took the boards, um, they presented a couple of patients, uh, and it was apparent to me that these were acid-base questions. And so what I did is I had already figured out this little algorithm, and um, so I just wrote down the acid-base problems, and then I matched them up with the various patient scenarios, and it worked perfectly. You'll do the same thing on the boards if you use this algorithm to do that. Okay, so I said that we needed uh, to do some nomenclature or, or some definitions first. So there, I want you to be able to understand the meaning of the terms acidosis and alkalosis and acidemia and alkalemia. Now, we often use these terms interchangeably, but they are not. They really aren't. Acidosis and alkalosis are terms that re refer to pathophysiologic processes. Osis, process. All right, so for example, an acidosis is a pathophysiologic process that leads to the generation of hydrogen ion, 
or the consumption of bicarbonate. Alkalosis is a pathophysiologic process that leads to a loss of hydrogen ion or the production of excess bicarbonate. All right? Acidemia and alkalemia refer to blood measurements of either hydrogen ion concentration or the pH. So if the pH is less than 7.4, acidemia is present. The patient is acidemic. If the pH is greater than 7.4, then the pH is on the alkaline side, and the patient is alkalemic. Now, I know that we say, oh, this patient's really acidotic, but they're not. They're acidemic. They have acidosis occurring, but they're not acidotic. I mean, think, think of the way we use these terms. You would never say that a patient is anotic. No, you would say they're anemic because anemia is a blood measurement like acidemia and alkalemia. Now, the reason that it's important for you to know this kind of fine distinction in vocabulary is because you need to recognize that Acidosis can occur, but the patient's blood measurement could be on the alkalemia side if you have two acid-base disturbances occurring. And we're going to go over this in more detail, and you're going to see some examples of each one of these. So let's not say the patient's acidotic. Let's say they're acidemic. And let's not say they're al alkalotic. They, in fact, they're alkalemic. Alkalosis may be occurring. Okay. A couple more definitions. A simple acid base disturbance is a primary pathophysiologic process, either acidosis or alkalosis, and its appropriate compensatory mechanism. Right? So, even in a simple acid-base disturbance, there are a couple of things happening. You have a primary process and then the compensatory mechanism. A combined acid-base disturbance is when you have more than one primary process occurring and their compensatory mechanisms. So let me give you an example. All right, so here's a simple example. Patient has diabetic ketoacidosis, stop taking their insulin. They come in with DKA and they're breathing fast. So they have diabetic ketoacidosis and the compensatory respiratory alkalosis that goes along with that. That's a simple acid-base disorder. On the other hand, that same person stops taking their insulin they develop severe gastroparesis, and they're vomiting. They're vomiting up hydrochloric acid. And so now they have DKA, and it's whatever compensatory mechanism it entails, but they also have a metabolic alkalosis from vomiting. And so their values will reflect this combined acid-base disturbance. So you get the idea of what a simple disorder is and what a combined disorder is. All right, the last thing that you need to know in this little section is that the body never overcompensates. Now, if, if you have a resident or an attending that says, this is an overcompensated whatever, acid-base disturbance, you know that they don't get it because the body never overcompensates. If it looks like overcompensation, then it's a combined acid-base disturbance. You've got two may be unrelated, may be related, but you have two acid-base disturbances, not just the simple acid-base disturbance and its compensatory mechanism. So the body never overcompensates. So if you have a simple acid-base disorder, if the body never overcompensates, then that tells you something very powerful. And what it tells you is that if the pH is on the acid side, if acidemia is present, since the body never overcompensates, then you know that acidosis is occurring. A lot of other things may be going on, but if the patient's acidemic, you've got to have acidosis occurring because the body never overcompensates. If the patient is alkalemic, 
then you know that alkalosis is occurring because the body never overcompensates. So that helps you to figure out a simple acid-base disturbance simply by knowing what the pH is. Okay? You're going to find that very useful in a moment. So there are only two kinds of acid-base disturbances. This is so easy. You either have a problem of acid or a problem of base. So you either have acidosis occurring or alkalosis occurring. Acidosis can either be of metabolic origin or respiratory origin. Same with alkalosis. It can be of metabolic origin or of respiratory origin. And by knowing the pH, the bicarbonate and the PCO2, as I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides, you'll be able to figure out whether your acid-base problem is one of acid or base and whether it's of metabolic origin or of respiratory origin, and that should take you seconds to figure out. So there's only four possibilities here. Acidosis, alkalosis, metabolic or respiratory. Now, one last thing that you need to know about simple acid-base disturbances, remember the simple acid-base disturbance is the primary pathophysiologic process accompanied by its appropriate compensation. Well, the compensation the metabolic compensation for primary respiratory disturbances takes time. So the magnitude of compensation will be less for an acute respiratory process and more for a chronic respiratory process. And you need to know the rules of thumb that will tell you how much compensation there is for a respiratory process. You need to know these rules of thumb for the metabolic compensation of a respiratory process. Okay. This is the bicarbonate buffer system. And you spent a lot of time in medical school trying to understand uh, buffer systems. Um, I've taken a very simple approach to buffer systems. This is how a buffer system works. I don't know if anybody ever explained it to you like this. And, and I'm not a mathematician, so I don't get all of the, ma the math that goes into this, but this is the way it works. Assume that you've got a sponge, and that this sponge is completely dry, and it's, you're lying flat on a flat surface, and this sponge is right over your face. Right over the sponge is a spigot, a, a water faucet. And somebody turns that water faucet on very slowly so that one drop of water drips out of the faucet and onto the sponge. What happens? What do you see? Absolutely nothing. Because the sponge soaks up that drop of water. And if the sponge is right over your face, you can't even see that the drop of water hit the sponge. Nothing happens. No observation. Another drop hits the sponge, same thing. You don't see anything. Another drop, another drop, another drop. You're completely unaware that drops of water are falling on the sponge until the sponge is completely saturated. When the sponge is completely saturated and can no longer accept another drop of water, what will happen is a drop of water will hit the sponge and a drop of water will drop into your eye. That's how a buffer system works. It's the bicarbonate buffer sponge. It soaks up hydrogen ions instead of drops of water. And this is how the bicarbonate buffer system works. It works as an equilibrium between PCO2, that is the respiratory component of acid-base balance, and the serum bicarbonate, which is the metabolic component of acid-base balance. Now, one of the things that's really interesting about buffer systems is that all of the intermediate steps, PCO2 going to CO2 and water, CO2 and water going to carbonic acid, carbonic acid going to bicarbonate and hydrogen ion, they're all in equilibrium with each other. And mathematically, 
If you know the value of each end of this equilibrium expression, then you can describe everything that happens in between. Okay? That's the way buffer systems work. Now, the bicarbonate buffer system, as you know physiologically from your physiology, the bicarbonate buffer system is not the most important buffer in the body. In fact, the bicarbonate buffer system actually buffers very little hydrogen ion. Normal serum proteins are an enormous buffer system, and the bones are a much larger buffer system. As you develop hydrogen ion, it goes into the bone, replaces calcium. So the bones and the proteins are a much bigger capacity buffer system than bicarbonate. But, but you can't measure the bone as a buffer system clinically, and you can't measure serum proteins as a buffer system clinically. What we can measure is the PCO2 and the bicarbonate. But since all of these intermediate steps, all these equilibrium steps are in equilibrium with each other, and because every buffer system in the body is in equilibrium with every other bu buffer system in the body, if you know the PCO2 and you know the bicarbonate, you have described every buffer relationship in the body. And that's why we use the bicarbonate buffer system, because we easily measure PCO2 and we easily measure the serum bicarbonate. Now this is the math that describes those equilibrium steps. You'll recall from physiology, it's the Henderson-Hesselbosch equation. And if you know the pK of uh, carbonic acid is 6.1 and you can do 10th place logarithms in your head, then this is a very useful uh, uh, expression because it's a physical law of nature. The, the problem is that I've never seen a physician that, that calculated the Henderson-Hasselbosch equation, even with a calculator. We, do, we don't use this equation. It's, it's true. It's a true expression. And it, it, really, does, it, it really does relate pH and, and PCO2 and bicarbonate, but clinically it's pretty useless. So Jerry Kassir and Howard Bleich Jerry Kassir was a, is a nephrologist from Boston, and Howard Blake was a friend of his who's a mathematician. They rearranged the Henderson-Hasselbosch equation in order to get rid of the logarithm so that we could do simple math to calculate the same thing. And what the Henderson, or what the Kassir and Blake modification of the Henderson-Hasselbosch equation does for you is it relates the hydrogen ion concentration of blood to the PCO2 and the bicarbonate without having to do logs. But it does a variety of other things. So remember I said that in order to use my algorithm, you are going to need to know a couple of equations. So this is one of those equations. I, I, I would encourage you to write this down. And it, I, I can tell you that it, once you get to the acid-base questions on the boards, if you write this down, you'll get them all right. All right. So, so what does this say? It says that the hydrogen ion concentration here is related to the ratio, a linear ratio, between the PCO2 and the bicarbonate. When I first saw this equation, I had an epiphany. It dawned on me. Acid-base balance isn't a balance between acid and base at all. Acid-base balance is a balance between the respiratory component, the PCO2, and the metabolic component, the bicarbonate. All right, so let me give you an example here. So acidemia is present, right? That means acidosis has to be occurring because the body never overcompensates. The definition of acidemia is an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration, right? Well, there's only two ways that that number can go up. There's only two ways that the hydrogen ion concentration can go up. Either an increase in the respiratory component or a decrease in the metabolic component. All right, see how simple this algorithm is becoming? You look at the pH. The pH is too low you know that the hydrogen ion concentration is too high, so then you look at the PCO2. If it's too high, it's a respiratory acidosis. If the bicarbonate is too low, it's a metabolic acidosis. 
You should be able to look at this equation and those three numbers and make the diagnosis, acidosis or alkalosis, metabolic or respiratory, and it should take you seconds to do that. Well, this is also a, a useful equation because it will allow you to estimate the validity of the measures that you are given. So, if you know the hydrogen ion concentration and the PCO2, you can calculate back to the bicarbonate. If you know the bicarbonate and the PCO2, you can tell whether the hydrogen ion concentration is appropriate. Remember, this is a physical law of nature. If this equation does not balance, then either your blood gas is wrong or your bicarbonate is wrong. Now remember that when you're given a set of electrolytes, the bicarbonate is measured by one machine, and when you're given a blood gas, the, the pH or the hydrogen ion concentration and the PCO2 are measured by a different machine. You, when you get a blood gas, you may also be reported a bicarbonate, but that's not a measured bicarb. It's a calculated bicarb. They calculate it using the Henderson-Hasselbosch equation. So this equation allows you to check the validity of the biochemical measurements that you've been given, and it also helps you to establish the ratio between the metabolic and the respiratory components. It will also remind you of the direction of appropriate compensation. Okay, so let's take a look at this again. Let's say that the pH is on the low side. You know that your acid-base disturbance is one of acid. That means that acidosis is occurring because the body never overcompensates. And by definition, acidemia is characterized by an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration. There's only two ways that that number can go up, either an increase in the numerator, the respiratory component, or a decrease in the denominator, the metabolic component. So let's say that the PCO2 is 55. Well, now you know that this patient has acidosis of respiratory origin. What direction should the bicarbonate go in order to compensate? Well, remember, you're trying to return this ratio. The body is trying to return this ratio between the respiratory component and the metabolic component back to normal. So if the PCO2 goes up, the body is going to compensate by increasing the bicarb, right? Another example, let's say that the hydrogen ion concentration is increased. You know that acidosis is occurring to cause this acidemia. But you look at the PCO2 and the bicarbonate, and in this case, the bicarbonate is decreased. Well, what's the body going to do to try to compensate for that? Try to return that ratio to normal. So if the primary physiologic process decreases the bicarbonate, then the body's going to try to decrease the PCO2. So this equation will always remind you the appropriate direction of compensation. This is the, that, that's the only equation that you really need to know to do that. All right. Well, I kept talking about hydrogen ion concentration and not pH. When was the last time you got a blood test and it had the hydrogen ion concentration in it? Probably never because we don't measure hydrogen ion concentration in that way. We measure pH, and it, it has to do with the physical chemical way that we actually measure these, these substances. It'd be very easy to calculate the hydrogen ion concentration from the pH, but we don't do it that way. We measure pH. It just so happens that I've, I've, I've shown you here, I've, I've listed here, this is, this is the relationship, the red line is the relationship between pH and hydrogen ion concentration over the range of pHs from 6.9 to 7.8. And it's true that the relationship between hydrogen ion concentration and pH is a logarithmic, a logarithmic one over the range of 1 to 14, but you really don't care about a pH of 1, do you? And you really don't care about a pH of 14. What you really care about clinically is pHs between about 7 and about 7.7 .7 or 
because outside that range, your patient's not alive anyway. Okay? So, over that range, there is almost a linear relationship between pH and hydrogen ion concentration, and I've indicated that in the yellow line here. And as you get to lower and lower pHs, this tangent in yellow to the pH at a pH of 7.4 begins to fall away from the actual hydrogen ion concentration. And as the pH gets much above 7.6, you can see that the tangent, the yellow line, falls away from the red line, which is the true relationship between hydrogen ion and pH. At a pH of 7.40, the hydrogen ion concentration is exactly 40 nanoequivalents per liter. At a pH of 7.50, the actual hydrogen ion concentration is about 32, and my line here would give you a hydrogen ion concentration of about 30. At a pH of 7.3, the actual hydrogen ion concentration is 50, and the line hits almost exactly 50. At 7.2, the hydrogen ion concentration is 6.63, and my line would give you about 60. Well, Kassirer and Bleich, the guys that made up that equation, they recognized something very interesting about this relationship. They recognized that if you subtract, if you added, rather, the tenths and hundredths place of the pH, And the, and, the, uh, and the actual hydrogen ion concentration, they equaled about 80. So if you subtract the tenths and hundredths place of the pH from 80, you get the hydrogen ion concentration in nanoequivalents per liter that you need in order to use their equation. So a pH of 7.40, 80 minus 40, is a hydrogen ion concentration of 40. A pH of 7.30, 80 minus 30 is 50. So the hydrogen ion concentration is 50. Everybody get that? Okay, see how easy that is? Instantaneously, you can convert pH, if you know the tenths and hundredths place of the pH, you can convert that to hydrogen ion concentration. Okay? Can anybody tell me exactly what the hydrogen ion concentration is at a pH of 7. It's 100. It has to do with 10 to the minus the 8. Okay, never mind. If you're, if you're still, if you've got a patient with a pH of 7 and you're tr still trying to calculate the hydrogen ion concentration, I can't help you. Okay? patient has a pH of 7. You look at them. If they're breathing fast, they have metabolic acidosis. If they're not breathing and they're blue, they have respiratory acidosis. That's all you need to know. Okay. So here's the beginning of the algorithm. The first thing that you must do in solving any acid-base disorder is to determine, is it a problem of acid or base? And since the body never overcompensates, all you have to do is look at the pH. If the pH is below 7.40, acidemia is present, acidosis has to be occurring. If the pH is greater than 7.40, alkalemia is present, so alkalosis must be occurring, right? So, four things. Acidosis, alkalosis, metabolic, respiratory. By looking at the pH, you know whether it's a problem of acid or a problem of base should take you about a nanosecond to do that. The next thing that you have to do is you have to decide, is it a problem of metabolic origin or is it an acid-base problem of respiratory origin? So, you look at the hydrogen ion concentration. If it's too low, there's only two ways that the hydrogen ion concentration can go down. Either a decrease in the numerator 
or an increase in the denominator. And, okay. If the hydrogen ion concentration is too high, there's only two ways that that can happen, either an increase in the numerator or a decrease in the denominator. The numerator is the respiratory component, the denominator is the metabolic component. Just for, just for my own information, is there anybody in the audience that can't figure that out in about two seconds? By looking at the pH, knowing whether it's too high or too low, and then knowing that the PCO2 is the respiratory component and the bicarbonate is the metabolic component, you should be able to do this just like that. Okay. So, let's take a look at alkalosis. So, alkalosis is a process that either loses hydrogen ion or accumulates bicarbonate and results in a decrease in the hydrogen ion concentration. There are only two ways that that can happen. Remember I told you this would get repetitive? There are only two ways that the hydrogen ion concentration can go down or the pH can go up. And if the hydrogen ion concentration is too low, it's either because of a decrease in the re respiratory component, the PCO2, or an increase in the metabolic component, the bicarbonate. So you look at the PCO2. Is it decreased? Then you've made the diagnosis of respiratory alkalosis. You look at the bicarbonate. If it's increased, then it's a metabolic alkalosis. Let's say that the patient has a decrease in the respiratory component, the PCO2. There's only one cause of respiratory alkalosis, and it is overventilation. So if your patient has respiratory alkalosis, you know that they're overventilating. There's no other cause other than overventilation. There's no way that you can get respiratory alkalosis without overventilation. Now, the differential diagnosis of that overventilation is a little bit more complicated because there are lots of things, and I've listed some of them on this slide. So, for example, a variety of CNS disorders can cause overventilation, stimulation of the primary respiratory center. Stroke can do that. Infection of the CNS can do that. A variety of drugs can do that. You should know that, for example, salicylates, aspirin, a very common overdose in the emergency room, salicylates at therapeutic doses actually causes a stimulation of the respiratory center. But then so do a variety of other drugs. Estrogens do that too. Fever can stimulate the respiratory center to cause overventilation. If you have a patient that has an undiagnosed primary respiratory alkalosis, one of the hidden causes of that is the septic syndrome. So early sepsis can cause respiratory alkalosis. So be suspicious. Be suspicious that they may be septic, even before they develop lactic acidosis or, or an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Hypoxemia is a driver to the respiratory center and can cause overventilation. Hyperthyroidism, pregnancy because of the various hormonal changes. If your patient is on a blower and they have respiratory alkalosis, it should be because you, have, you want them to have respiratory alkalosis. Because if they're on a ventilator, you're in control of their minute ventilation. And they're getting an increased minute ventilation if they have respiratory alkalosis and they're on the blower. The diagnosis of anxiety disorder as a cause of respiratory alkalosis, so-called hyperventilation syndrome, is a diagnosis of exclusion. After you've ruled out all of the other issues, primary lung disease, CNS disease, and so forth, then you, then, then you deal with anxiety neurosis or hyperventilation syndrome. All right, so what about compensation? So we've already decided that this patient has alkalosis occurring because alkalemia is present. That's characterized by a decrease in the hydrogen ion concentration caused by a decrease in the numerator, that is the respiratory component. So what direction must the metabolic component change in order to return that ratio to normal? 
re remember that normally the ratio between the PCO2 and the bicarbonate times 24 is 40. So the body's going to try to return the hydrogen ion concentration to 40. So if, if the primary process is one that has decreased the PCO2, then you know that the metabolic compensation for this respiratory disorder will be a decrease in the bicarbonate. But remember, I told you at the beginning that the metabolic compensation for a primary respiratory disorder takes time. So the magnitude of change in the metabolic component will be less for an acute process and greater for a chronic process. So what I've shown at the bottom of this slide is the magnitude of bicarbonate or metabolic compensation for a primary respiratory alkalosis that has decreased the PCO2 by 10 millimeters of mercury. So acutely, if the PCO2 has gone from 40 to 30, the bicarbonate should drop by two milliequivalents per liter. After several hours or a few days, the body will compensate further and for that same 10 millimeter mercury PCO2 change, the bicarbonate will drop more by about five milliequivalents per liter. So you need to know this rule of thumb in order to know is this an acute respiratory alkalosis or a chronic respiratory alkalosis. And if it doesn't look like the compensation is appropriate, since the body never overcompensates, then you can make the diagnosis of a combined acid-base disturbance. Okay. You've determined that the pH is too high. That means that the hydrogen ion concentration is too low. There's only two ways that the hydrogen ion concentration can go down, either a decrease in the respiratory component or an increase in the metabolic component. We dealt with the respiratory component, so this example will be one of an increase in the metabolic component. Metabolic component is an increase in the bicarbonate. If you have a patient that has alkalosis of metabolic origin, it is useful to further diagnose the cause of their metabolic alkalosis by measuring the urine chloride. It's almost the only time that I measure urine chloride. If the urine chloride is low, and by that I mean much less than 10 milliequivalents per liter, then what you're talking about is a non-renal loss of acid because the, the kidney is trying to hold on to chloride. Chloride is hydrochloric acid. The, the kidney is trying to hold on to acid. So the urine chloride will be low. So you're look, looking at a non-renal loss of acid. GI losses, diuretics that lost acid in the past but are now no longer present so the kidney is working okay post-hypercapnic metabolic alkalosis. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Penicillin, high doses of penicillin or beta-lactam drugs, even cephalosporins can do that because they're anions. If the urine chloride is elevated, much above 10, then you're dealing with a renal loss of acid, some loss of control of renal acid. Cushing syndrome, exogenous steroids will do the same thing or the use of current diuretics. It's not the kidney's fault, but the diuretics make it look like it's the kidney's fault because the kidney can't handle acid normally, can't handle chloride. All right, now let's come back to this example of post-hypercapnic metabolic alkalosis. All right, so I want you to envision this in your, in your mind. Patient comes into the VA uh, and they're, they've got severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. You, you might see one of those at the VA, maybe more than one. And um, they are in respiratory failure with a PO2 of about 30, a PCO2 of about 80, and severe respiratory acidosis characterized by that increase in PCO2 and a compensated decrease, increase rather, in the serum bicarbonate, okay? 
So because they are so hypoxic, they get put on a, they get intubated and put on a ventilator. And whoever writes the ventilator orders knows how to write ventilator orders and they know what a normal tidal volume is and they know what a normal respiratory rate is and they want to bring up the PO2 so they put them on what, what would be normal and 30 minutes later you get another blood gas. The PCO2 has gone from 80 to 40. What's going to happen to the pH? The pH is going to skyrocket. It's going to go way up. Why? Because this patient had compensated respiratory acidosis. The compensation was alkalosis of metabolic origin, wasn't it? Well, now you've taken away the respiratory component and you've made it normal. So that denominator is now very high compared to that numerator. And so the pH will change in that way. It will make them alkalinic. So that's post-hypercapnic metabolic alkalosis. What will happen over time? Eh, the kidney will figure it out if they've got normal renal function. They'll get rid of the bicarbonate. The bicarbonate will come down and they'll return their acid-base balance, the balance between their respiratory component and their metabolic component back to normal. All right, let's talk about acidosis. Have you ever had a patient die of alkalosis? Neither have I. People die because of acidosis. So this is important. Acidosis is a process that generates hydrogen ion or consumes bicarbonate. It results, by definition, in an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration or acidemia. If the hydrogen ion concentration is increased, there's only two ways that that can happen, right? Either an increase in the numerator, the respiratory component, or a decrease in the denominator, the metabolic component. So let's say that you've already determined that acidosis is occurring because acidemia is present, and the cause of that is an increase in the respiratory component, the numerator, the PCO2. There's only one way that you can develop respiratory acidosis, and that's under ventilation, All right? Well, there are a variety of causes of underventilation, CNS depression, a variety of CNS processes, neuromuscular disorders, things like uh, Guillain-Barre or polio can do that. Thoracic cage limitations, unrestrained uh, motor vehicle accident, patient hits their chest uh, on the, you know, the passenger hits their chest on the dashboard of the, of the car, fractures all their ribs, have a flailed chest, no matter how hard they're breathing, they're not increasing their minute ventilation, so they underventilate. Impaired lung motion, like for interstitial lung disease, we see that in Kentucky with uh, silicosis and um, uh, carbon deposits from uh, both can occur from uh, in coal miners. Impaired lung function, like COPD, and if the patient is on a ventilator and has an increased PCO2 and a resulting respiratory acidosis, either it's a ventilator malfunction or it's an operator malfunction where you've not written adequate tidal volume, or they have such severe underlying lung disease that they can no longer exchange PCO2. And that happens in people that have very bad ARDS or very, very severe advanced lung disease. It has a terrible prognosis. If somebody has such very bad lung disease that they can't exchange CO2, whether it's acute or chronic, that, that's got a very bad prognosis. All right, well, what about the respiratory 
Uh, what about the metabolic compensation for respiratory acidosis? So remember that acidosis of respiratory origin is characterized by an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration because of an increase in the respiratory component, the numerator. The compensation that will occur is an increase in the bicarbonate or the metabolic component. Now, the metabolic compensation for a primary respiratory disturbance requires time. So what I've written at the bottom of this slide is the rule of thumb that tells you the magnitude of compensation. If you have an acute process that causes a 10 millimeter mercury increase in the PCO2, PCO2 goes from 40 to 50, acutely the body will only increase the bicarb in compensation by one milliequivalent per liter. On the other hand, if this respiratory acidosis has been present for many hours or a few days, then the metabolic compensation for this primary respiratory disturbance will be much greater and the bicarbonate will go up by about three and a half milliequivalents per liter. If it's outside that range, then there's more than one acid-base disturbance occurring. All right. Your patient is acidemic. That means that acidosis is occurring. By definition, that requires an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration. How many ways are there that the hydrogen ion concentration can go up? By now, you should answer two. There's only two ways that the hydrogen ion concentration can go up. Either an increase in the numerator, the respiratory component, which we already dealt with, or a decrease in the denominator the metabolic component. So now your patient has acidosis of metabolic origin. It is useful if the patient has acidosis of metabolic origin to know whether or not this acidosis is characterized by the presence of an increased number of unmeasured anions, the so-called anion gap. Well, let's think about what that is. Nobody ever really talks about what the anion gap really is. The anion gap is the difference between the unmeasured anions and the unmeasured cations in serum. So, you know, when you do electrolytes, you measure cations and you measure anions. But you don't measure all of the cations and you don't account for all of the anions either. So, you know, you you're only really measuring the sodium and the potassium, and they make up the majority of the cations, but you're not measuring magnesium, and you're not including calcium and selenium and rubidium and whatever else might be present, zinc. When you measure the cations, you're really only measuring bicarbonate and chloride. Remember that normal serum proteins are anions and they make up a pretty healthy portion of anions. And in fact, when you measure electrolytes, you don't measure more anions than cations. So there's always a, quote, anion gap. That is, there's always a, a positive difference between unmeasured anions and unmeasured cations. All right. so. So the equation is the anion gap is equal to the unmeasured anions minus the unmeasured cations. And you'll remember from seventh grade algebra that in order to calculate the, the relationship between two unknowns, you need to have two equations. Two equations, two unknowns, right? So here's that equation. The anion gap equals the unmeasured anions minus the unmeasured cations. Well, we know that the unmeasured anions plus all the measured anions, bicarbonate and chloride, is exactly equal to the unmeasured cations plus the measured cations. That is, you have electrical neutrality. All of the cations in your body are exactly equal to all of the anions in your body. If you didn't, Every time you touch the ground, there would be a discharge of electrons from your body to the ground or from your ground to the body. Not a healthy situation. You'd be your own lightning rod. So we know that, that 
the sum total of the anions equals the sum total of the cations. So we know then what the anion gap is, and we know then that the difference between the unmeasured anions and the unmeasured cations then is equal to the difference between the measured cations and the measured anions. And that's how we come up with this equation. The anion gap is equal to the sodium plus the potassium minus the bicarbonate and the chloride. That's how that was derived. It's very simple. It's seventh grade algebra. Two equations, two unknowns. You should kind of have an appreciation for that. So it is useful to know whether that value is normal. And if you use both the sodium and the potassium, the normal anion gap is 15 or less, about 15. If you have a patient that has acidosis of metabolic origin, it is useful then to know the anion gap. And if it is normal, then it's useful to know what the serum potassium is. Because if the serum potassium is normal or high, then you're dealing with a set of problems like dilutional acidosis. For example, where you have a patient that's volume contracted and their bicarbonate's relatively normal, so you give them a bunch of no normal saline and now you've diluted out the bicarbonate they had and temporarily their bicarbonate will drop and that's called dilutional acidosis. And it's usually caused by exogenous chloride. Early renal failure can give you a normal or high serum potassium and type four renal tubular RTA Type 4 RTA is a very classic cause of a normal gap metabolic acidosis characterized by a higher potassium. And it occurs when the distal nephron, the collecting duct, becomes insensitive to aldosterone. And so you no longer exchange sodium for potassium and, and sodium for hydrogen ion in the distal nephron. If the serum sodium is, if the serum sodium, if the, I'm sorry, if the serum potassium is low, then you're dealing with either proximal or distal RTA, the loss of bicarbonate by diarrhea, the use of carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, which causes a pharmacological proximal RTA, or sometimes in patients that have had obstructive uropathy, they re-implant the ureters into the colon, that's called ureteral diversion, and then the colon reabsorbs all this chloride, and you end up with a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis characterized by a low serum potassium and a normal gap metabolic acidosis. So some examples. If the anion gap is increased, it's because of the generation of increased amounts of unmeasured anions. And here are the most common causes. The mnemonic here you probably have heard is mule pack. Methanol ingestion. Methanol is a simple, the simplest alcohol. It's metabolized to formaldehyde and then formic acid. Formate is one of the unmeasured anions, but methanol also poisons oxidative phosphorylation. So you have the buildup of Krebs cycle organic anions. Uremia. In people that have advanced uremia, they develop a metabolic acidosis because they can't excrete their hydrogen ion, and it's often characterized by an increased anion gap because of the accumulation of phosphates, sulfates, and urates. Lactic acidosis of any cause, lactate is the unmeasured anion. Ethylene glycol, the metabolism of ethylene glycol to glycolate, also oxalate, and then the poisoning of the um, uh, Krebs cycle as well. Peraldehyde is an old sedative hypnotic, not used very much for that purpose anymore, but it is used for refractory seizures. Peraldehyde is metabolized to its acid. Aspirin in high doses, remember aspirin in lower doses stimulates a respiratory alkalosis, but in higher doses, it causes paralysis of the Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation, the buildup of lactate and other Krebs cycle organic anions. And in its highest doses, aspirin also causes suppression of the respiratory center. So it's, that causes a combined acid-base disturbance with a lactic acidosis and a respiratory acidosis. And then diabetic ketoacidosis is the 
prototype anion gap metabolic acidosis where beta hydroxybutyrate, uh, acetoacetate, and other Krebs cycle organic anions accumulate. All right. The, in patients that have metabolic acidosis, you can tell the magnitude of compensation because the PCO2 should drop to return that ratio as close to normal as possible, and the magnitude that the PCO2 decreases to compensate for a primary metabolic acidosis is such that the PCO2 equals the last two digits of the pH, the tenths and hundredths places of the pH. So let's say that you've got a metabolic acidosis uh, and the pH is 7.20. Appropriate respiratory compensation would suggest a PCO2 of 20. pH 7.20, pH, okay, by the, the PCO2 should drop to 20. If, let's say you've got a patient that's got a pH of 7.20, and a PCO2 of 30. It looks like inadequate compensation, doesn't it? Because their PCO2 ought to be 20. But what it really is, a combined acid-base disturbance. This patient has acidosis of metabolic origin and acidosis of respiratory origin because they couldn't appropriately drop their PCO2 to 20. Now let's take a look at a quick example. Hey, I want to take a look at this quick example. All right, so let's figure out this acid-base problem. Patient sodium is 130, potassium is 5.8, by chloride is 104, bicarbonate is 8. Their PO2 is 132, PCO2 is 20, pH is 7.19. All right, so the first question that you have to ask, do the numbers match? Do these numbers fit? Do they fit the henderson hasselbalch equation? or the Kassira and Blank modification of that equation. So here's your equation. Hydrogen ion concentration equals 24 times the PCO2 divided by the bicarbonate. The hydrogen ion concentration is what? 80 minus 19 is 61. The PCO2 is 20. The bicarbonate is 8 times 24. Miraculously, it equals 61. So these numbers balance. Is this a problem of acid or a problem of base? Well, the pH is 7.19. So it's on the acid side. So acidemia is present. You know that acidosis is occurring. So you know this is a problem of acid, not of base. Is it of metabolic origin? or respiratory origin. Well, since the hydrogen ion concentration is 61, that means it's increased. There's only two ways that that can happen. Either an increase in the respiratory component, the numerator, the PCO2, or a decrease in the metabolic component, the denominator, the bicarbonate. Well, which is it? Well, the bicarbonate's eight, so you know that this is a problem of, me of metabolic origin. So this patient has an acid-base problem that you've determined is acidosis and that it's of metabolic origin. They have metabolic acidosis. Is it appropriately compensated? Well, I told you just a minute ago that if you have acidosis of metabolic origin, the appropriate respiratory compensation will be to drop the PCO2 down to the tenths and hundredths place of the pH. So this patient's PCO2 is 20, and their pH is 7.19. So yes, this is appropriately compensated.